Good morning. Happy Wednesday. I have neuro coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right, Wednesday. Very exciting. Wednesday is exciting because tomorrow is chips and salsa day. It's also uh, 6 a.m. Uh, coffee and coaches conference call. Please join us for that. Um, go to my Facebook page, my professional Facebook page. The link will be up there um, in the wee hours of, of tomorrow morning. All you got to do is post your coffee prep on the Instagram. I will share that. And then you get to join us for a, a great conversation. We had a great call last week, um, which was really, really fun. So we dug into some stuff um, rather deeply, which was kind of neat. And it sort of initiated this whole foot thing. Um, so, yeah, it's been like a foot week. Um, and, and one of the questions today pertains to that. I'm going to do a twofer. So here we go. Um, first question comes from Alex. And Alex wrote me this um, synopsis of, of his presentation as a, as a uh, foundation for his question. But basically what, what he wants to know is um, in regards to the foot types, in my experience, the measures that you see further up the chain, do certain ISAs mirror certain foot types? Can the foot type detail um, explain the compensations expected outside of the, the tibia, the talus, and the calcaneus? So, so is the foot representation going to give us any information as to what we should expect to see above the foot? And I think this is a great question, Alex. But let me clarify one thing for, for Alex. Alex, you don't have a late propulsive foot. You get an early propulsive foot. Early propulsive foot to be behind and, and externally rotated. I got a really high arch and I got a plantar flex first ray. So you're early, bud. Anyway, um, that was for him. So regardless of the foot type, however, um, what we want to recognize is, is that the, the foot is our, our main ground contact. It's supporting all the load from above. And it stands to reason that if I have an orientation or a presentation above the foot that alters the position of the center of gravity, then I have to have a foot that is going to adjust to that. And so Alex, your, your question is actually right on point, unfortunately. Unfortunately, this is a really long conversation. So we, if we, we were at the intensive and you asked me this question at the intensive, we are going to have about an hour long talk about this. So let me just give you a little quickie kind of a, a representation here. So we think about all the possibilities as far as the orientations and, and positions that the pelvis could be in. And we have to recognize the fact that, that I have to control my center of gravity. I don't want to fall. And so the way that I would do that is I would make adjustments in the foot. And so let's just say that I have some sort of concentric strategy that I'm utilizing in the pelvis that's pushing me in a direction. I would also have to have some form of concentric strategy in the foot that's going to help me maintain my balance. And so, yes, these things do become very predictable. Let me give you a case in point. So I'm talking to... Um, um, Mr. Camperini last night and and uh, I sent him a, a little little foot thing and I, I I always test him I don't know why maybe it's because he's a former Padawan but I always want to challenge him and make sure he's on point and so I said hey what do you predict above the pelvis and he was really accurate because he has really dug into the model um, rather deeply and so I think that, that um, you make a really really good point here Alex is that we should recognize the fact that this foot is connected to everything else. There are relationships that are associated with the, the orientations above the foot. And yes, it is very, very predictable. It's probably something that we probably need to expand upon at some point in time, but I'm gonna have to do it in some other form. And, and unfortunately, I think that it's gonna be more of an intensive oriented kind of a thing where we have plenty of time to, to break these things down. So this short form video kind of thing just doesn't do it justice because it is rather detailed. But once you get it, it's incredibly powerful. Because just like we use iterations above and below in the axial skeleton to confirm our suspicions, we can use the foot at, uh, in the same way where we would expect to see a presentation in the foot that we would see up in the pelvis as well. So thanks, Alex, I appreciate that. Um, second question. Um, so, uh, fellow Austin also threw me a, a really good question um, because of, of what he's observing in, in the purple room. 
um, he's got some sequencing questions. And so, so Austin's question um, is, when you have a patient with a narrow infrasternal angle that is limited both ER and IR, how do you prioritize interventions to emphasize expansion where it is needed? So, so let's break this down first and foremost. So we've got some information, and let's just kind of see where we're starting from, and then that's going to tell us how we're going to, to uh, intervene. So if we've got a narrow, narrow infrasternal angle, <clears throat> and we're going to assume that we have limited uh, breathing excursion because we've lost ERs and IRs, so that tells us what we're, what we're looking at. So we've got a, an ER ilium, we've got a counter-nutated sacrum, we're just going to say that this person is symmetrical in that regard. So we can see this, this counter mutation and ER. So I got my narrow IPA. I've got, like I said, the counter mutation here, which is gonna bias my acetabulum back towards external rotation. If I have my full internal and external rotation available to me, my total physiological range of 100 degrees will be intact. So let's just say at the extreme, of this, let's just say that I have 80 degrees of external rotation, 20 degrees of internal rotation. I know that I don't have any superficial strategies that are that are negatively influencing the the position of the pelvis. However, um, Austin says, what if you lost ERs and IRs? Okay. So now we got to think about sequencing, about how a, a narrow would lose their their ranges of motion based on these superficial strategies. So because of the orientation of the sacrum relative to the ilium, I'm gonna see an anterior compressive strategy coming on first. That's gonna steal my IR, okay? Then I'm gonna see an orientation, most likely, that's gonna steal my ER. So now we know what comes first. So we got anterior compression first, and then we got the posterior orientation that is, that is driving the, the loss of ER. One other thing that I know is I also have some posterior lower compression that's associated early on with the narrow ISA presentation. So I also have that to be concerned with. But because I have an orientation problem, that's gonna prevent me from recapturing relative motions. So whenever I have the orientation situation in play, that's gonna be strategy number one. I gotta go after that. So my first intervention is going to be to try to reorient reorient that, uh, that entire pelvis. So as a unit, so we're not talking relative motion here, we're just talking about an absolute position of going from an anterior orientation to posterior orientation. Um, there's any number of ways to do that. It's gonna be a hip extension based type of an activity. Um, you get your choice in, in that regard. Now, because my next strategy would be the anterior compression, I wanna go address that as well. So that's gonna be the next thing I'm gonna do. One of the great ways to do this for narrows um, and get a big bang out of this because if I put you in a 90 degree angle, I'm gonna get the expansion anteriorly. And so I gotta think, okay, if I have this, this strategy in the pelvis, I'm gonna have that strategy in, in the upper thorax as well. So quadruped works great under these circumstances for a lot of reasons. Um, not only does it gonna get me the anterior expansion that I need here, but it's also gonna help me reduce some of the compressive strategy in the posterior lower pelvis, posterior lower rib cage. So again, very, very useful to go, to go quadruped under those circumstances. Last thing I'm gonna do with my narrow ISA person is I'm gonna try to restore Store the normal relative motion of that sacrum. So I'm gonna to try to bring the sacral base back into counter-nutation. That's gonna be more of your dorsal rostral stuff in the upper thorax, and so it's gonna mirror that. So, so again, from a sequencing standpoint, if we were to, to, to back up just a little bit, we're gonna go orientation, anterior expansion, posterior expansion for your narrow ISA client that has lost ER and IR because that's gonna strip away those strategies in the sequence in which they occur. So it's really, really simple. So I hope that's useful for you guys. Um, happy Wednesday, have a great day. Um, don't forget the call tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. Join us for coffee and coaches. Um, Chips and salsa day is tomorrow too. Have a great Wednesday and I'll see you tomorrow.